Get your uh, authorized version of the scriptures, the King James scriptures. And turn with me to 1 John chapter 2 in your authorized version of the scriptures. Go to where the scriptures are and what we're going to be looking at. Read along with me. Follow along. Please. This is not for your entertainment. 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 15, and we will read on to verse 21. 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We were just out uh, because we are expecting a snowmageddon, a snowpocalypse to come upon us here where we live. And um, we were at the grocery store getting some supplies. And man, every which way but Sunday you were looking. People wearing diapers. <laughs> just incredible. Just incredible. The love of the world that these people, these people who are lost, have for this world, the love that they have for this world and the things of the world, that they are willing to go blindfolded into any, into any enterprise that the Jesuits would lead them onto. Speaking, of course, of the steel of the Jesuit poniard and all their fictitious mandates. Well, it's not fictitious, is it? but it's based off of fiction. We're seeing these people's love of the world, aren't we? Verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. What is the lust of the flesh? Right away we think of, um, we think of, Lusting after a woman, or if you're a woman, lusting after a man. Oh, that uncleanness, yes. But it's a little bit deeper than that. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. What is the lust of the flesh? Yes. Yes. Impurity. Lusting after a woman with your eyes. Lusting after a man with your eyes. Yes, wanting to lay with a certain woman or wanting to lay with a certain man. Yes, yes, but is that the extent of it? Hmm? Self-gratification, is that the extent of the lust of the flesh? Luke chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and all the glory of them, the kingdom. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. You know, that is still something that is very valid today for a lot of people. He'll give you everything, but all you got to do is worship him. And the everything that he gives you is of what? Of this world. And also to James chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 5. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members, in your members, your flesh? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, Yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss. That ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ask for something of the Lord, only that you can consume it upon your lusts. Hmm. Hmm. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? 
Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Going along with the flow of things. You know, taking the, uh, what is it, the Tao Te Ching approach. <laughs> Insanity. Just going with the flow. Going along with whatever the world tells you to do, Satan tells you to do, who is the little g-god of this world. And they're all lining up like ducks in a row. Mm. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Mm. Lusteth to envy. And those of us who are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, we have the Lord, our Father, Jesus Christ, living within us. And he wants all of your attention. He wants all of you. Not just what you decide to give at, at, at any given moment. And see, so you separate that when you seek for things of the world because you are seeking things that are given over onto Satan for judgment upon this world. Naturally, naturally, that's going to arouse God's jealousy, isn't it? And the text we just read says envy. But when you start coveting the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, you're an enemy of God. And your heart is more than divided, isn't it? But looking at verse 16 in 1 John chapter 2 again, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I'll get there. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Just two verses, verses 10, if I can get there, verses 10 on to 11. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 on to verse 11. Very telling. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? The lust of the eyes. You get a whole bunch of stuff and it's like, ah, oh, I can see it. Yeah, now I can take my ease, right? Or putting wicked things before your eyes. Images on the television. Hollywood, Hollywood movies. And you got to be careful about the mind control elements of what you see in Hollywood and TV shows and commercials and stuff like that. And also walking outside your door with advertisements and people dressing as if they were harlots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see somebody has a bigger house and you want one even bigger. You see someone who has a better car, you want one even better. You want to see someone wearing fancy clothes. You want something even more fancier. Verse 16 in 1 John chapter 2 again. And the pride of life. The pride of life. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verses 3 on to verse 10. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, being separate than this, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, Railings, evil surmisings, hmm. perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such 
withdraw thyself. Gain is godliness. We have talked about this before. Immediately when you mention gain is godliness, what do you immediately think of? You think of money. You think of mammon, right? But it is much more than that. The gaining of popular opinion, the gaining of persons, the gaining of influence, the gaining of momentum, whatever it may be. Gain is godliness. It's not just relegated to money. you got to remember that, especially in these times that are going to be coming upon us. Okay? Especially, especially in these times that are coming upon us. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Nah. Verse 16 in 1 John chapter 2 again. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. What do you get from these advertisements hmm? from television from the media from the news to get bigger to get better build back better <laughs> ah. yeah it's all in tune to touch your greed your covetousness that you move forward in covetousness ultimately destroying yourself but see we have the church of the living God but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Are you content with what you have, or you just got to keep getting more and more bigger and better, huh? Yeah. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Doesn't say anything about having a roof over your head. Doesn't say anything about having running water. Simple, simplicity, having food and raiment. Let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Temptation and a snare. Willing to do things you wouldn't normally do that you may get this gain that they call godliness. And a snare snared by that temptation to do stuff you wouldn't normally do. And into many foolish, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. To be foolish is to behave as if there is no God. And hurtful lusts, like lusting after wanting to get a video game console. Lusting after getting the biggest movie that's out there. Lusting to get the most up-to-date, fancy-schmancy cell phone. That kind of thing. Also, foolish and hurtful lusts. I'm going to do my best to put you in the dust. To blow past you. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. Got to get, you got to stockpile all that stuff, huh? You got to get your own big little mini mansion, right? You got to establish yourself. The scriptures tell us which drown men in destruction and perdition. And with the psychological operation that, the ins that was instituted by the Jesuit order, Okay, the poison crown pandemic. Okay, look at how everybody is behaving. Look at what has happened this year thus far with the uh, poison crown psychological operation. We've had two variants come out this year, haven't we? Yes, it began with the crown, Corona. It escalated to the Delta the triangle, or pyramid. It is right now sitting at the Omicron, the eye. Oh, what will they think of next? And see, putting that into people, 
that fear, that psychological operation that they have instituted, gnawing at the fear of these people, gnawing at their fear, gnawing at their fear. And putting a little self-righteousness in there as well. You know, go ahead, roll up your arm for the steel of the Jesuit punyard because you're going to show just what a good Christian you are by killing yourself for the sake of others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all centered around greed, around lust, around covetousness. And see, we have the Church of the Living God and we are commanded to live simple. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But see, they have the world. Satan offers you all things. All you got to do is fall down and worship him. You know you're worshiping him when you go along with the Jesuit-created dictates, you know, by the Catholic disease creators and such like that. Verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many, many sorrows. Money answereth all, answereth all things, right? And Satan has beguiled so many of you that it is money that makes the world go round. Yeah. Yeah. But looking again at verse 16 in 1 John chapter 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is, in not, is not in him. That's verse 15, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but, of, but is of the world. You want to see a really good example of pride of life? Go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. Yeah, Daniel chapter 4. You want to see a really good example of someone who was in, you know, the pride of life? Daniel chapter 4, verses 28 on to verse 30. Daniel chapter 4, verses 28 on to verse 30. King Nebuchadnezzar was warned. Hey, you need to humble yourself. Getting a little too cocky. Getting a little too full of yourself. He received a vision in a dream. He was warned. But of course, he didn't take that warning. Let's look at what um, happened, what King Nebuchadnezzar said. The pride of life, good example right here. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. Pride of life. He had arrived, had he not? He was king and he knew it. What was he a king of? King of Babylon. But what was he really a king of? It was the Lord that allowed him to have that. If you were to continue reading. But that pride of life. Look at me. Look at where I'm at. Look at what I've been through. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at my possessions. Look at me personally. Look at me. Look at me. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Uh, Isaiah chapter 39 Isaiah chapter 39. King Hezekiah. Very good example of this, this as well. King Hezekiah, a godly king, a king who is in heaven. King who is in heaven right now as we speak. But he had some issues, obviously. Isaiah chapter 39. At that time, Merdach Baldan, the son of Baldan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard 
that he had been sick and was recovered. And as you know, you can read Isaiah chapter 38. Hezekiah was sick. He cried unto the Lord and the Lord healed him. It's like, okay. And he gave him 15 years, 15 more years of life after Hezekiah kind of wept onto him. It's like, come on, Lord, don't take me yet. And Hezekiah was glad of them and shewed them the house of his precious things. The silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah shewed them not. A uh, warning too, you don't show your enemy all that you possess. You don't show those who can turn around and rend you everything. You don't divulge all things to everybody. Verse 3, Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah, and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even uh, ah, they are come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Then said he, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shewed them. I bet you he thought he was doing good. It's like, yeah, boasting on, I bet you he thought he was boasting on the Lord, don't you? Yeah? Yeah? Man, look at all that. To, look at all this. Look at me. Look at me. See, God loved me enough to give me 15 years. <laughs> then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. For six, Behold, the days come, that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day, shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. This response from Hezekiah, has always kind of irked me personally a little bit. Because while it is true, I tend to believe that he said this with a kind of a prideful bent. Even though, we're, and we're going to look at this, even though it says that he repented of the pride that he had, it was still there. What pride was that? The pride of life. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. He said, moreover, For there shall be peace and truth in my days. And Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32. We read a little bit more into King Hezekiah and his little dilemma here. Verses 24 on to verse 31. In those days, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verses 24 on to verse 31. Uh, in those days, Hezekiah was sick to death and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. But Hezekiah rendered not according to the benefit done unto him. He was given 15 years. What happened in that 15 years? King Manasseh, who also is in heaven, that was so we speak. But King Manasseh, oh boy, he, he was quite a piece of work. The product of the 15 years that the Lord gave unto Hezekiah. You see the fruit of those 15 years in King Hezekiah. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. For his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, right here we see it, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. And he did. We, we, read, we already read it. And Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries 
for silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices and for shields and for all manner of pleasant jewels. Storehouses also for the increase of corn and wine and oil and stalls for all manner of beasts and coats for flocks. Moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance for God had given him substance very much. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gion and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. How be it? In the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. God knew what was in Hezekiah's heart. Who didn't know? King Hezekiah. See, to say that God didn't know his own, his own man here, Hezekiah, what was in his heart, is to say that God doesn't know everything. And if you are serving a God that doesn't, serve, uh, that doesn't know everything, then you're not serving the true God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. You're serving the devil. But there we see it. A good warning about this pride of life that we see here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. The warning. And verse 17. And the world passeth away in 1 John chapter 2. And the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And on this, of course, Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, verses 1 on to verse 5. Proverbs 23, verses 1 on to verse 5. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. You know, when the economy in America crashes, that Federal Reserve notes, the credit that is priestcraft, that just is magically produced out of nothing, you know it's going to do exactly that? They fly away as an eagle toward heaven? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'm going to go with gold and silver. Uh, James talks about how um, your gold and silver is cankered. Gold and silver in the time that is coming, the time of Jacob's trouble, gold and silver will avail you nothing because the mark of the beast is going to be implemented. And if you have gold and silver as a bartering tool, how is that going to help that man of sin, the son of perdition? It's not. Gold and silver, while that is scriptural currency, is not going to help, unfortunately. I see a lot of people recommending, get gold and silver, gold and silver. But when the economy is crashed, what good is that gold and silver going to do? You have to have something to back it off from, don't you? Yeah. And also another warning of this, Psalm 49. Psalm 49, verses 6 unto 11. Psalm 49, verses 6 unto verse 11. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. I've seen and know personally these Christians who are very quick to boast about their possessions, their money, their wealth. Remember, wealth is not just money. They're very quick to tell you, I'm a millionaire. Yeah, yeah, 
They boast. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, kind of like what King Nebuchadnezzar did. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. And we were purchased by what? The blood of the crucified one? The blood of Jesus Christ, God our Father? Okay? That he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeketh the, for he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. What's their thought? See, they're trying to buy immortality on earth. When immortality, true immortality, is uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, where we will never die. There is also another form, uh, another type of immortality that you don't want. The immortality that you will have burning alive in hell forever. So you see, when you die, dear friend, you're going to have eternal life. But where is that eternal life going to be spent? Burning in the lake of fire forever? Or with our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father? Which one is it going to be? But see, those who trust in the world boast themselves of their riches. And I've seen so many of these Christians do this. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. And what do we see here in verse 17? And the world in First John chapter 2, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And we are to hate covetousness. Yes, we are to covet spiritual gifts. But see, again, those spiritual gifts that we um, receive of the Lord are not meant to be hoarded for ourselves, but it is meant to be shared with others. You have a gift from the Lord and you're not sharing it? Oh, boy, man. Boy, oh, boy. <laughs> and, of course, let's go to Psalm 73, verses 18 on to verse 23. Psalm 73, 18 on to verse 23. Let us remember. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We have to remember about these people who are prospering in the world, brethren. Who are going along with the spirit, that spirit of Antichrist. Okay, we have to remember this. Verses 18 on to verse 23 in Psalm 73. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. You got a lot of money, you know, Federal Reserve notes. You got your stockpiles already. What are you going to do when they all fall flat? What are you going to do when the economy implodes? What are you going to do? Hmm? I can just see it with some of you millionaire Christians. Ooh, what are we going to do? As a dream, when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Their image. Their facade. You know, the lust of the eyes. Look at me. I'm trying to look better than so-and-so. Lest my heart was grieved. I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. And let's read verse 24. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. And afterward, receive me to glory. Let's read to the end of this psalm, shall we? Whom have I in heaven but thee? 
and there is none upon earth that I desire besides, beside thee. And see, when you let things of the world get in the way of that, oh, you're asking for all kinds of trouble. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Is God the strength of your heart? For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Now, go back to 1 John chapter 2. Let's continue. On to verse 21. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 15. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Last days, last time. Brethren, Brethren, we are more closer to the redemption of the purchase possession than ever before in history. This is a fact. When is the catching away going to happen? I do not know. Hopefully, now. <laughs> but you look around at what's going on in the world, what the Jesuits have instituted. They cannot go back. They have started something that will reach its fulfillment after you and I, the Church of the Living God, are redeemed, resurrected, caught up. Okay, This, as I said to you before, this, people, this is not going anywhere. In Australia, a dear friend of mine told me that they had freedom for about a week. But no, nope, all of a sudden they went back to their lockdowns, or not lockdowns, but all their stipulations, their dictates, and knifers and stuff like that lasted for a week. They can't go back. And go back to what? What is there to go back to? What is there to go back to? See, they have started the snowball a rolling, and it's gone past the point where they can't call it back. And like I have told you, I truly believe this, that this is how it's going to be until the redemption of the purchased possession. And also, too, you look at what's going on in Israel, about how all the Muslim nations want to destroy Israel, which is no new news, right? You also hear about that, and I'll leave the link for this in the description box, about this U.S. congressman talking about how they need to destroy the Temple on the Mount, and there's another uh, Muslim site as well. They've talked about that before. Both, well, they sure have. And for those of you Muslims out there, what happens when your mosque, the Dome of the Rock or whatever it is, is destroyed? That'll send you into a whoa, which is just what the Jesuits want to do. But as we know right now, brethren, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Gotta go roll up that arm of yours, get the steel of the Jesuit poniard, and also, remember, you doing that, that's the Christian thing to do. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. The lovers of their own selves. You'll take, you'll take poison, the steel of the Jesuit poniard. You'll do whatever you're going to do so you can live your little posh life with, from the things that Satan offers you. 
are not today men lovers of their own selves? Look here on YouTube. Look at these devils. Look at all look at all the attention they want to get while trying to hide in the shadows, like Beelzebub of Blackpool, hidden in Lucifer's love, with his bought subscribers. But yet he's a coward. But yet he wants to be known. And his little pet monkey, faithful servants of Christ or whatever, faithful servants of Christ. Yeah, faithful servants of Antichrist, John Kraken, who's doing his little bidding, his little pet monkey. He does all his dirty work. And see, Beelzebub of Blackpool, he is one of these types who goes after young people. Just like what Jesuits do. Hmm, very interesting. Very interesting, yeah. Those are two devils you got to watch out for. And these two devils, brethren, who are lovers of their own selves, they're covetous. They want to draw people away from the truth and have them pay attention to them. They're boasters. Oh, they're definitely proud. They are the ones who are blasphemers. They worship flesh. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful, unholy without natural affection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially Beelzebub of Blackpool. Yeah. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, can't hold water. Fierce despisers of those that are good. There's nothing good in me that is in my flesh. But see, the Lord lives within me. Hence, I belong unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is none good but one, that is God. And these people, like Beelzebub of Blackpool, his little pet monkey, the Kraken, okay? Also, there's that Alex Kennis guy who is an open, at least, supporter of the Knights of Columbus. But yet he floats around on people's channels who call themselves King James Bible-believing Christians, yeah, and they're amening him and giving him hearts and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Devils like that. Devils like that. They're traitors. They, they, they'll turn on their, on their own friends, if they have any. Heady. High-minded. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Watch out for these devils. And, you know, Beelzebub of Blackpool, he has a myriad of channels. But, see, the thing is with him, um, you can catch him in how he words things. If you are aware of how to, how he can use language to deceive people in typing with his fingers because he's such a brave keyboard warrior. Same with John Kraken, you know, the Kraken. But see, Kraken, he's just a puppet. He's just a puppet. He's doing the uh, dirty work of Beelzebub of Blackpool because this devil goes to the youngsters. He likes young boys. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Hmm. Yes, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. And again, the Kraken, he has, I mean, he pretty much doesn't make any bones about it. He's got, between these two devils, I would not be surprised to learn that between them, they have 300 channels. <laughs> and they can make them just like that, to drop a comment, and then you block it, and no skin off their backside. These are the people that we have to deal with, brethren. And we have to be aware of this. Oh, do we have to be aware of this? Verse 13 in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They're being deceived by who? Satan. And they're going about deceiving people. None of these devils that I've mentioned, Beelzebub of Blackpool, uh, the Kraken, uh, Alex Kennis, the Knight of Columbus, 
Come on. Yeah, I mean, you people who call yourselves King James, Bible-believing Christians, and you see that guy coming around and you're giving him, wow, wow, Silar, uh, that guy from Asia or whatever who he doesn't like me and I don't, I'm not really fond of him. Even he had enough brains to say, hey, this guy's a Catholic, like I mentioned in the previous video. Yeah, even he was like, wow, hey, guys, <laughs> you know, good for him. At least he can see that and have enough brains to be uh, be aware of like, wow, there are Catholics, open Catholics, talking with these guys, and these guys are okay with that. Yeah, yeah. And remember about Alex Canis or whatever, if I'm mispronouncing your name, okay? Uh, you were the one who, on the video about the uh, secret oath, you were the one calling the secret oath a lie. You were defending the Jesuits. Obviously. And, and you, uh, King James Bible-believing Christians, you're okay with this guy floating around, huh? What does that say about you? Oh, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. These devils don't teach anything. All they do, are all their purpose is, is to create confusion, distraction, contention, strife. Apparently, amongst Christians, <laughs> Christians, I have been told that there's a lot of accusation, a lot of pointing fingers. Hmm. Isn't it interesting that rumble means to shake things up, and yet there's a lot of rumbling going on between Christians right now? Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Hmm. I don't see it amongst those who are of the church of the living God. Finger pointing, accusation. Hmm. Go back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And of course, where do we go for this? You want to know this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, the son of perdition, as he is appropriate, uh, that's, you call him the son of perdition or the abomination that make it desolate. Again, people, he is never referred to as the Antichrist within Scripture. Deal with the Scripture. But, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The falling away. You know, yes, someone of the church of the living God can get messed up. But with what we're seeing nowadays, brethren, the falling away, I am fully persuaded, Yes, someone of the church of the living God can get messed up and can get led astray. The falling away is verse 19 in 1 John chapter 2. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And that is happening quite rapidly. Oh, this year. Like, like I said, Beelzebub above a black pole, the Kraken. Those guys don't count. They're, they're lost. You're a couple of lost devils working for the Vatican. Oh, and incidentally, Kraken, I never called you a Jesuit. I was talking about your big brother, Smiley, the one who sits at Satan's table. Okay? Him I was talking about. And about him, I'd like to see him turn on his order. If anyone was going to, I always thought it would be him, but... <laughs> 
Apparently I was wrong about that. But I was never talking about you, Kraken. Number one, you're too young. Number two, you're too stupid. And number three, you're already the property of Beelzebub of Blackpool. You're already his little pet monkey. Okay? I never called you a Jesuit. Thank you very little. Okay? Those who you serve, now that's another story. But see, the falling away is not those who are of the church of the living God who get messed up. Because what? The spirit of truth will lead you into all truth, right? Guide you into all truth. And if you mess around with the Lord, um, he will deliver you. Uh, you'll be handed over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. No, no, no. See, the falling away are those who say that they are Christians. And then what? Because they are lovers of their own selves. They expose themselves for what they truly are, lost infiltrators. That is what the falling away is, brethren. And this year, you know, we had the Peltiers, who I thought were our friends. Oh, they were so kind to us. But then all of a sudden they turned on us. They said they, they saw something off in me, which was, which kept, what came before that though was, they let us know about their hatred for Mr. Brian Denlinger. And they, the Peltiers, try to get me to go after Brian Denlinger, as many of you have, not those of you of the Church of the Living God and whatnot, but a lot of the emails that I get, okay, um, a lot of people have wanted me to go after Brian Denlinger, to start making videos about him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when I made it clear that's like look i got bigger fish to fry okay i've got bigger things to do than to focus all what the lord has given me to do on one man okay there are bigger things to do than that and soon after that they turned they turned and tried to try to um pull everybody apart from one, one another turn people against each other okay very wicked people. Uh, the video I made addressing them is, uh, I'll put it in the description box, is uh, Beware of Infiltration. That was made with the Peltiers in mind. Okay? But of course, and on a personal note, on a personal note, the saddest one to me was that tragic young Scotsman. Yes, Aaron Murray Guerin Judge. That was the saddest one. We were warned. Myself and three other witnesses can testify to the truth of what was going on with Mr. Aaron Murray Deering Judge. Not just me, but three others. Two of them are silent. One, eh, not so silent. <laughs> and me, here I am. That was the most tragic. That was the most tragic. Because that tragic young man was afraid of Beelzebub of Blackpool. And also, too, what happened with him was he totally flipped. He totally flipped and changed what he was preaching. He was preaching the true gospel. Then he started preaching the love gospel. Totally totally flipped, totally flipped. And, and this was the sad thing. This was the tragic thing. He lied. He lied. And he was blaming other people. That one video that the Kraken uploaded, you, you can see it. He, he's like, like the devils are like, hey, wake up. You got to talk now to the camera. He lied about Great many things. That was the saddest thing. That was the saddest one. That that was sad. That was really sad. That was really sad. And I hope you get things straightened out and come out on fire with, uh, with love of the Lord. I really do. But you shot yourself in the foot. And we see, not taking personal accountability, but blaming others. Blaming others. It was always someone else's fault, not your own.
And like I said about Mr. Aaron Murray Daring Judge, yes, when he came clean to four of us, I should have rebuked him then and there. And I admitted to that in the, I believe it was in the video that I made about Mr. Mer, uh, Aaron Murray Darren Judge was um, Fear, Paranoia, Chaos. That was the video that I made about him. I'll put that in the description box. Okay. Yeah, that was very tragic. That was very tragic. There were four witnesses to testify to the truth of what was going on while you were preaching. And you lied about that. But I should have, as well as others, but I should have spoke up and rebuked you sharply right away. And amen, you are right about that. And I admitted to that publicly before. But you lied. You lied. Saying that I was the one who told you to smoke marijuana, which I never did. You lied. Eating it, that's something else. Smoking it, I never said that to you. And there are witnesses. There are witnesses. But see, brethren, the closer we are getting to being redeemed, resurrected, caught up, these people who we think are saved, that is the falling away. That is the falling away. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Verse 20 uh, in 1 John chapter 2. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. An unction from the Holy One. What is that unction from the Holy One? What is that? Oh, go to Ephesians chapter 1. See, this is what these devils do not have. They can fake it for a while, but this is what they do not have. They do not have this. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 on to verse 14. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Redemption of the purchased possession, sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Ghost, our Lord Jesus Christ, he is that seal. And also, and also in 1 John chapter 2, Look at verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Okay? The anointing. That's talking about the Holy Ghost that we are given, the Comforter, who is our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. This is what these devils do not have. They can't even fake it. But see, they're counting on people's ignorance of scripture. Okay? And they make arguments over petty things that are easily disproved. But see, they're banking on that people don't know the scriptures. That is their strong point. The ignorance of God's word on, on to most people. Okay? That is, their, that is their strong point. That's what they're banking everything on. That these people don't know the scriptures. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't. Oh, they might know something from a Bible. But not from the scriptures. John chapter 15, verses 1 on verse 8. I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. 
sealed unto the day of redemption. You have the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that Spirit living within you. These devils don't. Obviously. Obviously. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, note who's doing the abiding. We are abiding in him. We walk with him. Okay? And if he lives within you, he is in you. He's not going anywhere. Once saved, always saved. But remember, you living your life to the scriptures is not at gunpoint. Don't forget that. If any man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so that ye, so shall ye be my disciples. And looking down to verses 18 on to verse 27 in the same chapter. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Now we have the church of the living God who adhere our lives to the scripture. They hate us for adhering our lives to the scriptures. Guys like Beelzebub of Blackpool, yeah, they don't like him because he's, he's a jerk. <laughs> he's a jerk in general, okay? Oh, he puts on a nice facade that he's a sweet old man. He lied to you kids about his age, by the way. Something to do with the year 2009. I can't remember offhand. <laughs> but, see, the world hates us because we adhere our lives to the scriptures. We've encountered this all the time. Just by, you know, my wife dressing like a lady. Me, you know, dressing in things that, you know, are neutral, you know, that don't, you know, that kind of stuff. And also, the way we behave, our conduct. Adhering our lives to the scriptures. You adhere your lives to the scriptures, the world is just going to hate you because of that. But then there are those out there who purposely go out of their way to start trouble, to cause stirs and tumults, to get animosity that way. I personally believe that Peter Ruckman was one of those who purposely stirred the pot to get people to pay attention to him and to get strife aimed at him. That's what I personally believe. And that is reminiscent in those, of, uh, in those who follow him. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. Hmm. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father seen and both hated both me and my father. And see, here's the big thing. That satanic <laughs> trinity. <laughs> Pick your part. The trinity. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The trinity. The satanic three person that make one God. Trinity. Oh, that's a big thing. See, these Catholics are all upset about the skin suit because they worship the Eucharist. But at root, this issue of the three-person trinity versus the true God of the scriptures, one God comprised of spirit, soul, and body. Oh, that, that's not going away, brethren. That might be under the surface, 
But that's still a sore point. That's still a sore point. Because remember in the book of Revelation, the Trinity will be manifest. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's why these Catholics are so rabid about the Trinity. That's why you see people like, oh, they are speak again to hell with your Trinity. Yeah, to hell with your Trinity. Oh, he just blasphemed the Trinity, yeah? Kind of like the person who wished me a Merry Christmas and hoped that the Holy Trinity blessed me. <laughs> yeah, no thank you. No thank you. No thank you. But Jesus said right here, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father? But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the father, he shall testify of me. And ye shall... And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. And while we're here, John chapter 16, verses 7 on to verse 14. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Oh, but I thought the Father was the one who was sending the Comforter. But yet Jesus is sending the Comforter. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. You Trinitarians, you do not believe on the true God of the Scriptures. Of righteousness because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the Prince of this world is judged. Satan. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will shew you things to come. He shall glorify me, and shall receive of mine, and shall shew it unto you. Verse 20 in 1 John chapter 2. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. And ye know all things. Because you are sealed with, until the day of redemption. Right? Right? Now, go to Isaiah chapter 9. So, the Father, the Comforter, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Those are not individual persons, by the way. The Scripture never calls them persons. Individual persons. Okay? Three persons, three divine persons that make one God. That's blasphemy. That's insanity. Okay? But Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 on to verse 7. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this see Jesus Christ is the father he even said he was he even said he was and of course we go to John chapter 15 once again, <laughs> John chapter 15, once again, just two verses now. John 15, verses 23 and 24. Okay, read this again. John chapter 15, verses 23 and 24. 
He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. And John 14, John 14, verses 5 on to verse 10. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, shew us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Oh, this is so simple. It's these Trinitarians that mess it up. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Shew us the Father? <laughs> Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the soul of the Godhead? Okay? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Jesus is the Father. And going forward, brethren, you got to remember, two fronts thus far, okay? Two fronts. The Godhead, that is still not going away. And salvation, obviously. What is salvation? Is it just believe? Hmm? Is it because you're a good person worth dying for? You know, the love gospel? Or is it because you cleaned up your life before you went to Christ and then he gave you repentance? Mm -hmm. Also, they talk about the catching away, but if you, <laughs> if you are one who believes that, you believe that Christians are going through the great tribulation, you're right, Christians are. But those who are of the church of the living God, we get redeemed before the time of Jacob's trouble. But during 2022, this issue of the Trinity versus the Godhead will rear its ugly head again. You watch. You watch. Back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 21. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth but because ye know it, and that no lies of the truth. Devils can know the truth. But what is truth? Who is truth? They can know truth as it is written, but to know truth as it is written is to know Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. See, the, a lot of these devils, okay, they can... Aaron Murray Daring Judge... He was able to produce wonderful sermons. He really was. But see, the word of God speaks for itself. But within, within him, there is no conversion. Because the word of God speaks for itself. See. So see, lost people, devils, can know truth. But knowing truth from an inner conversion, by being sealed, they have not. And hence, the main point. See, those who are lost need to hear the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. But what about the false convert? See, the false convert knows already, don't they? They've heard about the death, burial, and resurrection. They know about the blood. Okay? They know about that. What does the false convert really need? What does the false convert really need? That's what we're going to be basically looking at. That's why we started in what we have started. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. They were never of us to begin with. 
And oh, this year in 2021, a lot of people turned and shoot their true colors, didn't they? Didn't they? And it's just going to keep getting worse and worse, brethren. People who we thought were of us are going to be made manifest that they're not. Because you got to remember what it says in Titus chapter 1. Titus, go to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscious, conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Hence the devils that I have already mentioned. Hence a trait of those who are not of us. They profess that they know God. But see, their walk doesn't match their talk. Not at all. Not at all. Hmm. Hmm. And also, too, you got to remember about these false converts, these false brethren. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And refuting pagan uh, traditions is not a doctrine of devils, sir. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. We right away think of Catholics, but it's not just Catholics. Some of the Hindus, Muslims, can command to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. You can eat pork. Yeah. Why? Because if you are saved and you know the truth, that circumcision made without hands is it is there. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Old wives' fables. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that, is, that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Already covered this. There are some of these devils out there. It's like, see, everybody's going to be saved. Uh, what does this say? He's the Savior of all men. But not everybody is going to come to him on his terms. Unless you come unto the Lord on his terms, broken of your self-righteousness, godly sorrow, having contrition, okay, and fear of the Lord, calling upon his name, and hopefully he save you. If you don't go to him on his terms, uh, you're a thief and a robber. You climb up some other way. Just like all these easy believism heretics, uh, and the uh, love gospel heretics, and the world, uh, Lordship Salvation heretics, okay? They're thieves and robbers. They go up another way, see? And you watch in 2022, more so of these devils are going to be made manifest. You watch. You watch. The closer we get, the more is made manifest unto the church of the living God, who is and who ain't, okay? <clears throat> These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, be, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, self-sacrifice, 
in spirit and faith and purity. And why did he say, let no man despise thy youth? Because Timothy was brought up in the scriptures. Okay. Till I come, give attendance to reading, not being keyboard warrior. Okay. <laughs> Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. How many of you waste your time keyboard warrior, uh, being a keyboard warrior? These devils that I've already mentioned, it's, it's, as, it's as if they spend 24 hours a day on a computer. They're that busy. You and I as the church of the living God, we ought to be that busy in the scriptures. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. In other words, you'll be a good example. You'll be a very good example. And of course, Galatians. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Talking about these false brethren. Okay, Galatians chapter 2. Verses 1 under verse 5. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also and went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles but privately to them which were of reputation lest by any means I should run or had run in vain but neither Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised go back under the law and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. whom To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. False brethren brought in. And then you read in Jude about how these men crept in. All to bring us into bondage. Speaking great swelling words of liberty while themselves are the servants of corruption. But what does the false convert really need? There are two types of false converts. One that is ignorant, whether that be willfully or just not knowing better, and then there are those who are deceiving and being deceived. There are two. Go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. going to look at a really good example of someone of of a of a thing here we're going to look at these of those who do not know being ignorant because like I said two types of false converts ones who do not know whether it's willful or pure ignorance and those such as the devils I have mentioned that are here just to deceive to cause strife debate to get all eyes turned on to them Okay, those are the two types of false converts. Ones who do not know whether willfully or uh, out of pure ignorance and deceivers, false brethren. Let's look at the example of those who do not know. Acts chapter 17, verses 16 on to verse 23. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Athens, Greeks, Gentiles. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. It is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Greek is a Gentile. The gospel was given unto the Jew first and then it came on to us, the Gentile, to make them jealous. See, okay? One gospel, all right? The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? That is the gospel, the blood that he shed on the cross to cleanse us of all our sin, okay? But he's, it says here that he went, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. 
Paul, and you read in the book of Acts, he went to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. And Paul is the apostle of the Gentile, while Peter was the apostle of the Jew, which is why Catholicism pays so much homage to Peter. Because remember, Catholicism, the Jesuits, they are replacement theology. So they take the apostle who is the apostle onto the circumcision, the Jew, and make them make him their own. <laughs> okay, that's why they spent so much time focusing on Pope Peter. Okay, but why did he go to the Jew first? Our Lord said, beginning at Jerusalem, yet, but. There's another reason, too, why he went to the Jew first. Go to Romans chapter 3. Why to the Jew first? Okay? Yes, our Lord said, beginning at Jerusalem, yes, it's to the Jew first. But why to the Jew first? Okay? Because of the promise of the fathers, unto the fathers, yes. But, also this. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. What advantage then hath the Jew... Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. The Jews, the Hebrews, were custodians of the scriptures. The true God of the scriptures. They were the ones who were supposed to, supposedly knew him. Okay? They were the ones who had the scriptures. They were the ones who knew the true God. So, it's meat that he goes and disputes with them, the ones who should have known all these things about their Messiah. And go to sec, um, uh, Romans chapter 2 now. Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse 17, on to the close of the chapter. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And art confident that thou thyself art a blind, art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that teachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, and who is the law given unto? The Jews, the Hebrews, that line chosen of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not all of Shem, okay? Abraham, Abram, was of Shem. But that line from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and unto Abraham, was attributed first Hebrew, remember. So the line of the Hebrews is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? God's chosen people, that line, okay? And unto them were committed the oracles of God. Unto them were given the law, okay? Hence, when we've covered this before, hence, when you see in the scriptures, Jews, it's in reference unto the Hebrews, okay? Let's continue. Verse 23. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profit, profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. How is that possible? Because if you break the law at one point, you're broken at all. That's why no one could ever keep the law perfectly. Only one could. God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, you morons. Ugh. Okay. Beg your pardon, brethren. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. 
and that circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, meaning the, the Old Testament law, whose praise is not of men, but of God. See, under the Old Testament, the law was there to make atonement for sin. Blood sacrifice, you know, sacrifice the blood of bulls and goats and whatnot. Okay, you had to keep the law in order to be right with God. Okay, and your faith was that God would honor you for doing what he said according to the law. You had faith in what God will do. Whereas today we have faith in what God has done. I already covered this before with you. Okay, not going to get into it right now. Okay, but he went to the Jews first because they were the ones who were supposed to know about this. They were supposed to know all about, about all this stuff. Okay? So he went to them first. They were the ones who had the scriptures. They were the ones who were supposed to have recognized their Mashiach. And we all know that they didn't, and it came on to us to make them jealous, to bring them back onto their God. Okay? Skipping a little here. Okay? Well, no, we're not going to skip this. Go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We want verses 21 on to verse 26. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And those who were Jews, those who kept the law, who was the law given to? The Hebrews. And hence, today there are those who call themselves Jews and are not, such as these wicked black Hebrew Israelites. Oh, wow, those guys are pretty wicked. Roman Catholicism, replacement theology. Well, they don't openly call themselves Jews. They have their main focus as Pope Peter, okay, the Queen of Heaven, Mary, right? They're, they're Mary Samaramus, right? Their replacement theology. Mm -hmm. They call themselves Jews and they are not, okay? But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. So you take out that A, God is spirit. How are you supposed to discern which is which? Especially when you're reading a Bible and not the scriptures. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And to John Hagee, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Oh, Jesus just said he was the Messiah. He didn't say I am the Messiah, but he's like, I'm the Messiah. Okay? And now John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verses 39 unto verse 47. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? See, there are those out there when reading the scriptures, it becomes just a mechanical process and that you thinking just merely reading the scriptures gives you life. But see, 
the one who is the author of the scriptures, who will guide you into all truth, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, who is the Holy Ghost, okay? He will lead you, guide you into all truth. See, that's why so many devils out there can come up with these really good sermons and be scripturally, scripturally accurate, okay? Because the scripture speaks for itself. But see, unto them it is a mechanical process, okay? As it was for these Jews, it was mechanical. They had the scriptures. They had all the evidence to point to the truth that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. But they loved the praises of men more than God. They sought honor from men and not the honor that cometh from God only. See, they were all about being one of the boys, being with the in crowd, okay? Hence, it was a mechanical thing not life-giving. Jesus was not talking against the scriptures. He was upholding the scriptures in John chapter 5, okay? You can read about this in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 5 on to verse 13, okay? The difference between one who is drawn from the breast while the other, it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You read that on your own time, okay? But see, the difference is one which has been drawn from the breast, weaned off the milk, okay? Who has God within them. The scripture is life. And you read it line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. But those who have not the spirit, who see it merely as a mechanical means, it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, that they might fall backward and be destroyed. And of course, Acts chapter 15, verses 7 on to verse 21. Acts chapter 15, verses 7 on to verse 21. Acts chapter 15, <laughs> verses 7 on to verse 21. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my, by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And this was Peter speaking. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? He's right there saying, look, Nobody can keep the law, so why should we have a demand of these people to keep the law, something that we and our fathers can never do ourselves anyway, seeing how Christ freed us from the curse of the law. But we believe that through the grace, not belief, by, but the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this did agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and will build again the ruins thereof, and will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, okay, and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood, Catholic. For Moses, right here, for Moses of old time hath him, hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Aha! This is why Paul went to the Jew first, especially in this context in Acts chapter 17, because 
They had the truth. They were the ones who were supposed to be letting the people know about this. But they were not. Were they? Now let's continue in Acts chapter 17, verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the, of the Epicureans, thank you, brother, and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And of course, for this, Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, philosophy. See, a lot of these devils, such as the ones I have mentioned, they all go down, they all will it down to being philosophical in their approach to scripture, to their approach of things. They get very philosophical, philosophical, philosophy, the wisdom of men. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 on the verse 8. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's a very good definition of a Catholic, by the way. Who use philosophy, the tradition of men, the rudiments of the world, you know, your penances and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Then certain of the philosophers of the Ep Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Have you ever noticed, and about Babel, well, look up Genesis chapter 11, uh, verses 1 on to verse 9 at, at your own time, on your own time. Check that out, about babbling, okay? Have you ever noticed that you are the church of the living God, the Lord can orchestrate a circumstance, and you could be speaking to someone who speaks in the same tongue as you do, but yet you're speaking different languages? Isn't that strange? Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 under verse 17. Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 under verse 17. And the disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the actual physical, literal kingdom in Jerusalem. Okay, the thousand year reign of our Lord Jesus Christ on the earth with us. Okay, that's the kingdom of heaven. This We're looking at this for instruction and in righteousness. Okay, but because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables. Why? Because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed be your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. 
And of course, in Second Corinthians and First Corinthians chapter two, it talks about how the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of the Lord, because they are spiritually discerned. Okay, the natural man, the ones who are not saved, are not going to get deep spiritual scriptural truths of scripture because they don't have the comforter they don't have the lord the spirit of truth within them guiding them into all truth obviously obviously not eh and looking at verse 18 in john and uh, acts chapter 17 he seemeth to be a set of forth of strange gods because he preached unto them jesus and the resurrection. He took to his lips the trumpet of the resurrection. And what strange, what was he preaching to these people? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 on to verse 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And see, the Jews had these scriptures. At the time when Paul wrote that, okay, the completed canon of scripture was not available. They were using the Old Testament scriptures from the Jews had these in possession. They should have known this. Now verses 19 on to verse 20. In Acts chapter 17. Okay. And they took him and brought him unto the Areopagus. Aero, Aero Areopagus. Thank you, brother. Saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know thereof what these things mean. Hmm. For all the Athenians and strangers that were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And right away you might be thinking, well, there is no new thing under the sun, right? Um, for that, go to Ecclesiastes chapter uh, chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new, it hath been already of old time, which was before us. Now, in context, the new thing is that what there is, does what we just looked at in here in Ecclesiastes apply for this, what we just looked at in Acts chapter 17? No. No, it doesn't. Because they, they didn't know. They were ignorant. They didn't know. Because Paul took to his lips the trumpet of the resurrection. Yeah. He preached to them the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection. The atonement for our sins in his blood. That's what he took to his lips. That's what he was preaching to them. So to come to Ecclesiastes and say, well, there is no new thing under the sun. This doesn't work for this, um, for this context. Not at all. No, not at all. Not at all. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, we want verses 14 on to verse 21. Verses 14 on to verse 21 in Isaiah chapter 43. Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans, whose cry is in the ships, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters. 
and out of your belly will come living water, if you come to the Lord on his terms, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Look at this verse. The beast of the field shall honor me. The dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall shew forth my praise. Look at verse 20. Okay. A new thing. The beast of the field shall honor me. Do you know that by the circumcision, we who are not of the circumcision, were called just that, uncircumcision? Unto the Jews of today, who are Hebrews, who are practicing their Kabbalah Judaism, we are referred to as Goyim. And they use that with a little kink, with a little um, nick to us. You know, a little like, you know, hey, you're not that special. You're Goyim, okay? I personally believe that now, speaking literally, yes, the beasts, the beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons of the and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness, okay, and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. The kingdom of heaven was first often offered unto the Jews. The gospel was first offered unto the Jews. Then came to us, the Gentile, to make them jealous. Go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Verses 9 on to verse 16. Acts chapter 10. Verses 9 on to verse 16. Now, we, we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4, that's where it says that, yes, you can eat pork. Not here. Okay? Not here. Acts chapter 10, verses 9, on to verse 16. On the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up unto upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts, check this out, of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, three times, in order to drive it into Peter's thick head. Okay? This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Hence the three times, three times he denied the Lord, three times the Lord's like, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And this three times. Three times had to get drilled into his head, okay? Now, while Peter doubted in himself what the vision which he had seen should mean, he, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Shimon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Shimon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. So, in... Isaiah chapter 43, verse 20. I believe that might be a reference onto this current disp dispensation because even our Lord referred unto us as what? Dogs. It's not me to give the children's bread onto dogs. But yet he's allowed us dogs to be grafted in to that kingdom of the Jew. 
see. So, when he says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 20, about beasts of the field will honor, and the wilderness will honor me, the dragons and the owls, I believe that's a reference on to Gentiles. That yes, that we, the Gentile, will be grafted into the tree of the Jew to make them jealous. And notice here, that Paul has the uh, Paul that Peter had to have this happen three times in order for him to get that. Okay, that us Gentiles were grafted in to the tree of the Jew. And that, uh, where was that? Uh, one second, brethren. And while in Acts chapter ten, sorry about that. Look at verse twenty-eight. Uh, actually, uh, verses twenty-six on to verse twenty-eight in Acts chapter ten. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Peter wouldn't have someone bow to him. Interesting. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Here it is, Ye know how that it is unlawful, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come on to one of another nation. But God has shewed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And see, these Athenians did not know this. Did they? Did they? A new thing. We Gentiles, the mystery of the gospel, that us Gentiles were grafted in to the tree of the Jew. Unheard of. You just heard it from Peter. It's not lawful for us to be with those who aren't Jews. But what God has cleansed, call not thou common or unclean. He made a new thing. He brought us Gentiles into the tree of the Jew to make them jealous. And see, these Athenians did not know that, did they? They were ignorant. And Verses 22 and 23 in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verses 22 on to verse 23. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars hills and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Bibles say religious. There's a big difference between being superstitious and being religious. For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Ignorantly worship the unknown God. They didn't know who God really was. So these people were ignorant. These people were not saved. But they were worshiping something that they had no idea what. They were ignorant. They didn't know the true gospel. They didn't know the true God. Even when the Jews were there present to inform them of the, new, of, of the true God. Which is why Peter, or why Paul went to them at first. But see, these people were ignorant. Okay? And you got to remember, for those of us of the church and living God, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yes, we're going there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 on to verse 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We have the church of the living God. We're ministers of reconciliation, okay? To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In him. 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. To the unknown God who you ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. Uh, who is he? What, what was Paul declaring? Was he declaring one God of three divine persons? Nonsense. No. No, he was not. No. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, you morons. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Okay? Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Uh, you got to remember something about Romans chapter 3, brethren. Just because the easy believism heretics only center them their gospel that they preach in about what? One, two, three, four verses or five verses. That does not mean that we should not be using Romans chapter 3 in the appropriate context. The God that he... Uh, uh, preached on to these people, okay? Romans chapter 3, verses 19, on to verse 28. Now we know that whatsoever things soever, now we know that what things soever, excuse me, the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God, in, the, in his sight, excuse me. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's why the law is there, to make us aware of our sinful state that we need a redeemer, a savior, okay? But right here, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes? What about you personally? Oh no, it's always someone else's fault, right? Yeah. No personal accountability? Uh-huh. Good luck with that one, boy. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. That, might, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. This is the God unto whom he was giving testimony onto. This is the answer. This, in and of itself, is not the gospel. This is the answer. This is, he's declaring what has been done, what God has done for us. Okay? The gospel is, clear, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, that is the definition. And to be saved, you come to the Lord broken, contrite, and you call upon his name in fear of him. Okay? Okay, this is the answer. Okay, this is describing what was done. Okay, that's what that is. This is what you tell people. Okay, note it's in Romans chapter 3, and before all this, it tells you how worthless you are and what a sinner you are. Before verse 19, you know, verses uh, 9 on to verse 18. 
which these easy believism heretics like to leave out. They also like to leave out about by uh, uh, verse 28 especially. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And these people call prayer a work. Okay. Calling on the name of the Lord is a work. Uh, the works that are being talked about in their very chapter that they go to is talking about the works of the law. And prayer is not a work. Neither is calling upon the name of the Lord a work. Okay? And also, you got to remember too, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter nine, verses, beg your pardon, 19 on to verse 27. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. See, these Christians in these church buildings have this insane idea that in order to reach lost people, the saying is, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. To win the lost, you got to be like the lost. That's not, no, no. And that's not what Paul is saying he did, okay? To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. He was made all things. See, right here in verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all. Well, he did it himself. No, but then what do you do when you get to verse 23 or verse 22, where it says, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. What does this mean? Paul submitted himself unto the Lord. He put everything he had upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord orchestrated his circumstances and sent him onto people, okay, of the Gentiles, okay? It says, unto the Jews. He went to the Jew first, okay? But the Lord orchestrated where he would go, okay? And he submitted himself onto that, okay? He was, wherever the Lord would have him to preach, was where he would preach. Unto whom he would share the gospel, he would share the gospel. It didn't matter who. He submitted himself unto the Lord. That's why he said, that. that's why it says, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Well, in verse 19, it says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all. It's not a contradiction, okay? He gave himself totally unto the Lord, and the Lord used him. Okay? That's what that means, okay? It wasn't that he became as a lost man in order to win the lost. God forbid. God forbid. And as we see in Acts chapter 17, that brought him unto who? Like the Epicureans. And the Stoics to the Athenians who did nothing else but looking for some new thing. Right? Let's continue. Let's continue. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Okay? And now let's go back to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Because I have something here written for verses 24 on to verse 25. But you know what? We're going to forgo that for right now. 
we are going to forego that for right now. See, these people in the book of Acts, chapter 17, they were ignorant. They did not know better. They didn't know. They didn't know. Okay, Were they converts to the church of the living God? No, they were not. Obviously not. Obviously not. Because in verse 23, For I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. There are some out there who will begin their walk with the Lord being in error because they don't know. Okay? They just don't know. But then when someone of the church and living God comes around and corrects them through the scriptures, the Lord corrects them through the scriptures, they are no longer ignorant. Okay? And hopefully they will conform to the scriptures, to the truth. Okay? So someone can be a false convert not knowing the truth, can be ignorant. But then again, there are those who are deceitful, deceiving and being deceived. And it is coming close unto the time of Jacob's trouble, if you remember. We first need to be redeemed, caught up, resurrected before the time of Jacob's trouble. But we see clearly here, we see clearly, ignorance. Ignorance. There are those out there who are ignorant. False converts. How many times have we come across people who like, I thought I was saved. I thought I was saved. I was, uh, many uh, that I know personally, they thought they were saved because I fell for the just believe thing. They didn't know. They didn't know until they were corrected. Until one, saw, for as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And look at verse 30 in Acts chapter 17. And at the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. You come to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord, call upon his name. You are sealed until the day of redemption. You, are, you have eternal security, assurance of salvation, because it's his salvation, not your own. Okay? There are those out there who are ignorant. And we of the church of the living God, are so, which have the word of reconciliation, are supposed to be the ones, the pillar and ground of truth. Okay, but the other of the false convert are those, the deceivers, deceiving and being deceived. That is what we are going to talk about next in the next video, because this is going to be a two part video. So stay here, stay tuned for part two of this video. See you in the next video.